So this is the second South African accent you're going to have to get used to. So um, let's bring up the slides. So, uh, Paul, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much uh, for being here today. Thank you for the invitation to speak here. So, I've got to tell you about travel issues for Paralympic athletes, and I've got to do this in 20 minutes. So, this is about a two-hour lecture that I've got to condense down to t some take-home messages in a 20-minute period. So, I thought, what is the best way to start this off? And I think the best way to start this off is showing this slide. So whenever I'm asked anything about Paralympic athletes, it's very easy to answer that question. The answer is yes and no. You see? So the question here is, are things different with Paralympic athletes? The answer is yes and no. So they're all the things that apply to able-bodied athletes, but then there is like kind of special extra things that one has to think about as well. So why I really, as a sports physician, have gravitated to Paralympic sport is if one looks at sports medicine, you've got a fantastic scope of medicine. It goes from everything from injuries all the way to illnesses. It's about people treating people with chronic disease, with exercise. And then you look at the exercise part, and you've got exercise that is used, and you have the human physiology going at the extremes of exercise, which makes this really complex. But now you work with people who have various medical impairments and disabilities, and this puts another layer of complexity on top of all of this. So this makes this the ultimate challenge in sports medicine. So this is really difficult stuff. So let me tell you about this picture here. When I started working with Paralympic athletes, I had come from a long background in being the Olympic doctor for eight years with the South African Olympic team. And I'd come from being the rugby doctor, and I'd come from being the football doctor. And I had never, ever had a problem that I couldn't deal with when I was traveling. I now come for the first time to the Paralympic team. And what happens is you see this glove over here. This is a latex glove. That's my first problem I encountered. Flying to a distant country, I think it was Beijing. What happens is one of the Paralympic athletes, in the middle of the flight, takes out a glove from, I don't know where they found this glove, and blew it up and released it into the air to go <laughs> across the aeroplane. Unbeknown to that particular athlete, they had a latex allergy. And the lips swelled up in the middle of the aeroplane and to such an extent that I was worried that this athlete was going to stop breathing. So that was my introduction. And what happens is that you never know in Paralympic sports medicine what you're going to get. Because there are all of these congenital or acquired abnormalities that are linked with other kind of genetic problems as well. And this might be an increased susceptibility to uh, medical issues. It might be increased susceptibility to being allergic and so on and so forth. In my second trip, looking after a Paralympic team, and it wasn't even my own Paralympic team. I was flying to Christchurch with athletes on board a plane from another team that didn't have a doctor. And one of the Paralympic athletes going to that competition had seizures mid-flight. And that's why I always travel with not latex gloves, but Rivitrol. And I make sure that if anything, if I'm going to take one medication with me, it's going to be the Rivitrol. So this is <laughs> really my take-home message. Yes and no. They're kind of normal things, but they're these kind of things that you need to think out of the box about as well. So if I'm going to tell you about travel medicine in 18 minutes now, what I'm going to tell you is that you need to condense it down to these things. If you're a team physician traveling with a team, you've got to look after jet lag. You've got to think about what the risks are of illness when tra traveling. 
We want to know about what the common illnesses are, what your prevention strategies are going to be. Then we want to talk about what you need to consider with other environmental challenges of travel, which could be nutrition, heat, cold, and altitude. And then there are some practical guidelines that I want to give you before the journey, at the destination, and then on the way home. So let's go with the first one. I can't hope to actually tell you all about jet lag in a very short period of time. But you all know about these things. We know that there are Zeitgebers, which are uh, time indicators to the body. And what's the main time indicator to the body, which indicates circadian rhythm? Sunlight. Sunlight does it. So we know that depending on the sunlight and the more exposure to sunlight that one has and the, uh, the differentiation between sunlight and darkness is how we actually acclimatize. Now why does this have relevance? One of our large populations that we have in impairments is visual disability where actually the s signified sunlight coming through the eyes and there are two cues, sunlight on the body and sunlight through the eyes or eyelids might not actually penetrate the central nervous system to the same effect and therefore athletes with visual disability might take an extra time to actually acclimatize to the time zones and uh, therefore um, uh, take a bit longer to settle down. Now let's get to the second point after jet lag. That's all I want to say about it at this point in time. I wanted to start talking about the risk of illnesses and infections. And these are data that we've published looking at the incidence of illness during short duration. And what I'm talking about with short duration, I'm talking about less than four weeks tournaments because most of our tournaments that we're going to do are less than four weeks. And what I'll show you here is uh, a number of published data from the FINA World Championships, the 2010 uh, Winter Olympic Games, the Summer Olympic Games. Then we have the 2010 FIFA World Cup. And then we have the 2009 IAAF, uh, Summer of Juan Manuel's uh, uh, data over here. And then the Summer Paralympic Games. And you can see that there are two peaks here. We have the FIFA World Cup where we had quite a high incidence. We're still trying to work out why that was so high. But then have a look at the Paralympic Games. So my take-home message here is that in the, the incidence of illness in our um, uh, population is higher than in many of these other, other populations as well. And we'll get to that in a little bit more detail. But what does this mean for you as a team physician? Look at this clinical observation over here. We can expect that athletes become ill at a rate of 0.5% of all your athletes per day of the tournament. So you can work out how many athletes you've got in your group and work out how many you're going to see that are going to get ill over that time. So we did a very, very interesting study using a rugby population during travel to try and learn more about this effect of travel on illness. And what we used is the Super Rugby Competition, which is a competition which involves South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand teams, where they are flying around from one country to another for a period of about three months. So it's a very long uh, competition. So what did we want to do? We wanted to look at the incidence of illness at baseline before the people traveled, then after the travel, and we looked at time zones of more than five hours trained, and then what we looked at is what happens when they return back home from the country. And what we found out is that this was the baseline number of illnesses per thousand player days, was about 15.4. Now the athletes traveled either from there to here or from here to there. And look at what travel does to you. Regardless of if you're going east to west or west to east, the fact that you leave your home environment and you travel somewhere foreign gives you nearly a doubling of the incidence of illness. So you might ask, yes, but what happens when these athletes go back home again? It's not the travel. It's the destination. Going back home, your incidence of illness goes back down again. So what this means is that it is not the travel per se, but the destination that one is going to that is very important. And what that means for our medical teams is that they have to prepare very, very carefully for the destination one is going to. So let's look at other implications. This is 
all of your data so you can see where your country fits in to this area here. This is looking at illnesses at the London 2012 Paralympic Games with country clusters. So we've clustered all countries together into more kind of a continental divide here. So what does this show you? First thing that it shows you is that there's a huge home advantage of just staying home and having the competition in your country. So we have a look at all illnesses. The rates here in the UK for the London uh, Games were 12.1. Uh, now you can see low incidences in North America, in Europe as well, even in Eastern Europe here and, and uh, Russia. But we see that we have data that shows that Africa is very high and South America is high as well. I was particularly interested in uh, looking at Africa and when we divide it into north of the equator and south of the equator again, we see that sub-Saharan Africa is a particular problem here with very, very high illnesses. So where one comes from and where you travel to are very, very important. So I'm going to be speaking a little bit more later about respiratory illnesses. And you say, well, can countermeasures be productive? And I'll show you some of uh, Nick's data here where the British team nearly eradicated respiratory illnesses from their team by using great countermeasures and having the benefit of actually being having the home ground advantage. So, advice to reduce the illnesses in the traveling athlete, be aware of higher risk periods of illness, knowledge of the expected illness and types, traveling you need to know your destination, the altitudes, pollen, allergens and food, medical screening is very, very important, Here's general prophylactic guidelines. Vaccinate athletes timelessly. Use chemoprophylaxis for the many different uh, illnesses. I can't go into those. Hand sanitizers and no snogging. Avoid handshaking. <laughs> Probiotic use, very important as well. Your planning of medical support, I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Establish contact with medical colleagues and services in the destination countries. And we need to educate our athletes with respect to foods, bottled water, peeled fruits, that's for the GIT illnesses, report symptoms early, and we'll speak about that in a bit more. And pus, it's probably, if I had to point to one of these, where you reduce the risk of infection, it's this, it's the personal hygiene, and particularly those of you working with teams of athletes, like uh, a wheelchair basketball team, to get the whole team to buy into these guidelines as well. So... Um, let me just give you some practical guidelines as well with respect to take-home messages about before the journey, on the plane, and after the journey. The team physician really, if at all possible, needs to travel to the destination for a scoping visit before the, the rest of the team uh, arrives. And that is very difficult. And many countries do do that, and other countries just don't have the finances to do that. What are the things that you're going to look for? Your... Access is going to be one of the main challenges if you're looking at athletes with impairment. To make sure that there are the correct access, the correct support structures in the room and rooms environment to actually cater for various of the uh, disabilities. What are the environmental factors that you're going to need to look for? And these, this here is the checklist for you as a team physician to make sure that you know these various uh, factors. Number one is get to, uh, get to understand what the altitude of the environment is that you're going to be going to. And we know that there are certain athletes that battle with higher, uh, higher altitudes, and you need to watch out for those. And there are athletes who are absolutely fine at altitude. Then to actually look at the temperatures. And there are many of you who've taken your teams to hot environments. You've arrived here early. You've acclimatized. There are many athletes that have actually gone and practiced in heat chambers in order to actually prepare themselves to acclimatize. Then one wants to have a look at the allergens, and I'll show you a little bit more about what are the kind of things that you're going to be looking for. Then the atmospheric pollution. Then ultraviolet radiation, because if you're at very, very high risk, for example, if we were going to Australia or to South Africa where there's a hole in the ozone layer, you would advise your athletes to cover up and use sunblock more often. Access, as I uh, mentioned before, and then food and water quality is very important. 
So let's just talk about some of those in a little bit more detail. Exercise-induced bronchoconstriction and allergic rhinitis. We need to know what the allergens are in the environment that we're traveling to. So, for example, if you were traveling to South Africa, you would know that there are certain trees, certain grasses, and certain weeds that actually release their seeds and their spores into the air at certain times. For example, if you're trees, you don't have any problems up to July. July through to October is peak allergic rhinitis season, and then it tails off. Look at the grasses. The grasses are exactly opposite. Now, you think, is this important? And I look at my colleague Paul here, who's done the allergy testing in the British team and knows where, which athletes are allergic, which athletes are susceptible, and which athletes will probably struggle at that destination. And you can go to a pre-treatment program for these athletes beforehand using intranasal corticosteroids and other uh, uh, medications in order to avoid these particular problems. When we're talking about atmospheric particle pol pollution, we can differentiate between coarse fine and ultra fine. We can go and look at these are the four big ones that one has to look for. Ozone, nitrous dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and organic compounds which might also add in to allergies as well. And one knows, according to the WHO, what the guidelines are. This is downloadable from the WHO website, and you can see that the country that you're traveling to either is going to have a problem or might not have a problem and again one can use different countermeasures in your athlete population based on that. We know that there is the ultraviolet UVB index scale that is also downloadable from various different websites for this information in the country that you're going to be traveling to and that really allows you to determine how many minutes of exposure until you burn. And you don't want your athletes to actually burn because that is a systemic problem. A sunburnt athlete is an athlete who has high markers of inflammation. They are more susceptible to infection in that area. And you get an athlete that is not going to perform if they've got sunburnt. So this is very important as well. And there's moderate, high, and very dangerous. I know that in uh, South Africa, Australia, we're sitting in this dangerous to very dangerous uh, zones. So, um, I want to just uh, scroll back a little bit to this uh, slide uh, because I thought I had put in two of them and I hadn't. Um, so, here we are. Medication laws. The laws for each country you travel to are different. Remember, in your Paralympic population, you're going to be having medications, many, much more medications than one would if training with an, or taking an able-bodied team. Some of these medications might not be legal. For example, there are some Paralympic athletes that need, for example, medical marijuana that they're using. And that is a problem because that might be illegal in a country and there might need to be uh, laws that are changed or special appeals that are made in order to cater for some of these medications. Opiates are another uh, um, uh, medication that is illegal to travel with and we might need to have certain documentation in place for some of the athletes. Most airlines give a course for adapted travel. It takes about five hours, but it's a very good five hours that you can use. For example, what they do is they ex instruct the medical team how in the instance of an emergency do you actually get a team of wheelchair basketball players to evacuate the plane? What is the best way to do it? What is the best way of actually lifting those armrests in between all of the seats or the one that actually goes from the outer seat into the aisle. This is really useful information because you too will use it one day when you're in a seat when you want some more space. So I've learned these little tricks, you see. There's another trick that they will teach you that if any of your athletes get stuck inside the toilet, how you can actually open those toilet doors from the outside. So it's really a worthwhile course to do. Then get the seating plan. And the seating plan, we need to make arrangements well in advance for athletes who are tall, who are using uh, prostheses. And this is a good time to actually start planning for your athletes with high needs as well. So, for example, if a whole team is traveling, they usually give a whole lot of upgrades to that team. You don't know about it because the officials usually use them. 
But this is not the right thing to do. That is me meant to actually get the athletes with higher needs to that part of the plane that actually can accommodate them uh, better. So the seating plan is very important. Athletes that are wheelchair users should be seated close to the bathroom so that if they do need uh, assistance to actually get to the toilet, it's easier to do it that way. And that also leads into the drinking requirements. A lot of the athletes who are not mobile decrease the amount of fluids they intake on the plane in order not to be forced to go to the, the toilet. And that's a problem because uh, uh, flying is very dehydrating and you want to actually get them going to the toilet as normal or even more. Also know that one hour before you leave, uh, athletes who are, uh, need assistance, for example wheelchair users, are loaded into the plane and they're loaded off one hour afterwards. So that prolongs the flight quite substantially. Watch out for some of your athletes if you have a connecting flight getting lost. For example, athletes who are intellectually impaired, and other athletes, for example, some of our athletes with cerebral palsy, tend to wander around the airport and actually not make, the, or make everybody nervous getting to the next connection on time. Okay, everybody helps with kit, regardless if you're the doctor, physio, official, Everybody needs to actually assist because when you're going to be working with a Paralympic team, there's a lot of paraphernalia that actually moves with and you've got to actually be strong. So it would tell the medical team you've got to train for your trip because you're going to be carrying lots of things. And then uh, the upgrades for high need uh, individuals, if one can organize that, that is uh, very beneficial. So in moving towards the end of my talk in the last minute, I want to just talk about uh, during the journey, the usual movement guidelines of actually moving the limbs and actually walking about might not be possible for the athletes, but just to encourage as much movement as possible. If the uh, physios are traveling with to actually do lower limb massage or use compression garments in order that we don't uh, predispose to DVTs, Advise on the hydration, particularly your athletes who are adverse to hy um, hydration. Remove prosthetic devices, I'll speak to you a little bit more uh, later. Assist to the bathroom and back. And remember anti-infection protocol. I must say that using the anti-infection protocol of using masks, of using first defense, using other um, uh, uh, countermeasures, actually the Paralympic uh, community takes this more seriously, in my experience, then our rugby players or soccer players who are very difficult to actually get to actually use these countermeasures. These athletes are much more professional uh, when it comes to this. The journey home. My experience tells me to leave as soon as possible. So as soon as competition finishes, that's the time to actually get out and go back home. My busiest day I've ever had was after competition. I've had, oh, I beg your pardon, alcohol intoxication sunburn, lacerations, unprotected intercourse, and a sprained ankle, all in the same athlete. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the flight home is very important. Sometimes we put all our planning into the flight there, and then we kind of think that the flight home is now kind of after competition, but the flight home is as important. Remember the difference is now the athletes are gonna scatter. You're gonna lose control of the athletes after you've arrived home. Again, you have the same thing, the same issues. You've got to use DVT prophylaxis again. Don't forget about that. But be aware that disease can manifest once you've got home and you've gone back home. For example, if you've been in a malaria area, we've had it, I've had it that one of my athletes have developed malaria 10 or five, five to 10 days after we've got home. Counseling to continue medications, for example, tetracyclines for uh, prophylaxis of malaria. Um, note that new symptoms might still be related to travel. High index of suspicion in a DVT after the flight. Okay? Beware of a unilateral swollen leg. A great example of something that might not be applicable to the uh, athletes with impairment because there might not be a leg to compare it to. So, having said all that, I'm sorry I'm two minutes over my time, but thank you very much for your attention.